This is a, um, um, and a picture of, of, Flint, of, of, of the Flint Hills. One thing I wanted to point out here, just very quickly, before I get into the actual geologic history, is that, and you guys probably all know this, but when you're on top of a platform, the soils are very thin. The rocks are very close to the surface, right? And if you're up in a section that has flint bearing, uh, limestones, the surface will be covered with flint, pieces of flint. Okay? So the, the soils are very shallow here, but on the slopes they're much thicker because again the, the mudstones are underneath uh, erode more quickly. So what you have is different plants, um, different essentially ecosystems um, or associated with the platforms versus the, the slopes, different vegetation, uh, because the soils are going to be deeper uh, on the slopes than they are on the, the platforms. And another thing you see, I think some of this has been mentioned before, this is a uh, limestone, I actually think this is the cottonwood in this case, um, but notice where all the scrubby trees are. They're right along the base of the limestone. And the reason that is, is because the, although the limestone itself is not very permeable, doesn't let water through it, has lots of cracks. It will move down through those cracks, and then the mudstones underneath, the shales and mudstones underneath are actually pretty resistant to water. Um, they're, they're a water barrier. So the water goes through the limestones, hits the bottom of the limestone, so it hits this impermeable layer at the bottom of the limestone, and then flows along the bottom of the limestone. And that's where the water comes out of springs. So the wettest places on the prairie are at the bottoms of the limestone layers. And that's where you'll see your scrubby vegetation. The reason the cottonwood's called the cottonwood is that's where all the cottonwood trees grow. I mean, it's just, but they do that not just in the cottonwood limestone, but all the limestone. So that's where all the scrubby vegetation it's going to grow your dogwoods and cottonwoods and things like that. Um, is along, and you can actually do geology by just looking at the looking at the prairie, looking at the line of scrub on the prairie. Those are all the limestone layers, the bases of all the limestone layers. And then when you get down to the bottom lands, obviously, then you're, you have much thicker soils, deeper soils, deeper muds. These are actually on Pleistocene muds, um, so deep soils, and you get. Nice tall grass. So, um, so now I have to go fast. Okay. Um, what about the rocks themselves? <coughs> um, all the, the rocks, not just here, but just in the Flint Hills generally. So this is the whole Flint Hills from Nebraska to um, Oklahoma. Um, represent rocks from called the late Pennsylvania into the early Permian periods, an interval something like 290 to 270 million years ago. Um, so what was the Earth like at that time? So if people get curious about what the world was like that long ago, it was very different in a lot of ways. The geography was very different. Here is a uh, reconstruction from that time of the same time as rocks were being formed here. Notice that all the continents are pretty much gathered together in one large continental mass. Anyone know what it's called? I should have hidden. <laughs> but Kansas would be right about here. Uh, notice there's a bit of an inland sea, which as we'll see came and went repeatedly. But Kansas would be right about here, about 10 degrees north of the equator, right? This is a high mountain range. This is what is now the Appalachian Mountains, the remnant. This was a mountain range as high as the Himalayas uh, and much longer, uh, stretching from Scandinavia uh, all the way down into Texas. Uh, so we have this large mountain range here. Uh, and then there's some mountains also to the west called the Ancestral Rockies. And then this big, broad, very low relief, flat area in the mid-continent. Notice also down here, we'll come back to this. 
says continental glaciers, that's going to be significant. Um, okay, so what about, that was kind of the general paleogeography. What about the, the critters themselves? Um, this was a time before the age of dinosaurs. For anyone who thinks and knows about dinosaurs, it was before the dinosaurs. That kind of puts it in perspective. So this was um, before the uh, arrival of mammals. There were no mammals on the face of the earth. Um, it was even reptiles had only been around a short period of time. Um, and those reptiles were represented. One that people most know about is. Uh, you know, Dimetrodon, the sailbacked reptiles, they're from the early Permian. Uh, so um, they were the largest kind of vertebrates going at the time. Uh, <clears throat> and all kinds of large amphibians, kind of, um, kind of like giant frogs on steroids or something. <laughs> okay. um, so a variety of very large amphibians, some primitive reptiles, um, plants very different than today. Um, same in the oceans. Now here it was a case where we do have fossils preserved because the limestones do preserve uh, fossils, marine fossils, pretty well. This is one of the more common ones. And again, I have some examples of, uh, of these here. Um, these are fairly large uh, shell animals. They're not clams. They're not thalassopods. They're completely different phylum, okay? Completely unrelated. The only similarity is that they have two shells. Outside of that, they're completely different beasts. Um, and most of the ones that you find here in uh, Flint Hills have these, these are broken off spines. So in life, these things would be covered in fine spines. And these really convex parts of the shell would be down, and those spines would be growing into the mud. It's kind of a way to anchor them into the, the sediment. Um, so brachiopods, and then various kinds of bivalves, um, both uh, things that look like scallop shells, or pectinid bivalves related to scallops, uh, things related to oysters, a bivalve, or a clam from brachiopod, if someone shows what's this, okay? We say that one. But two are mirror images of each other, okay? So one side, so I just think of regular clam, which you get at a restaurant, right? The one side of the clam is a mirror image of the other. One valve is a mirror image of the other. If I go back to the brachiopod, the two valves are different. They're not the same. But you can draw the line of symmetry down the middle of the valve. This is a mirror image of that. Okay? So the way I refer to it is if you're, um, if you're a clam, okay, or, or a, a, a bivalve, your symmetry runs this way down the body. So you have this side over here is one valve, and this side over here is your other valve. Yes. And your symmetry goes I am this so way. glad I got I that on video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. If you're a brachiopod, your symmetry runs this way, and you're like this. Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. So this is a brachiopod, and this is a clam. So if you remember that, you get, you get the symmetry right. Uh, Climbers are common. You will never see this. Sorry. Um, <laughs> But this is what the whole thing actually looks like. But what happens is when these die, they're made up of these individual um, plates of calcium carbonate. And when the soft tissues decompose, they just fall apart into the little pieces. So normally what you find is this little piles, often of these little disc-shaped things. Okay? These little disc-shaped piles look like little poker chips. So little disc-shaped things are pieces, segments of these crinoids, which were very common at the time. You might also find uh, sea urchins. Uh, typically what you find, but then again they fall apart, uh, but the individual spines, so you find these long uh, kind of pencil-like things, you know, maybe a couple inches long, um, those are sea urchin spines. But very occasionally you'll find plates of the actual body of the sea urchins. 
Bless you. Fusilinids. Um, these are important. I'll just pass this around. Um, um, look at it. Puts, uh, it looks like a bag full of uh, wheat grains. Uh, this is the dominant fossil in the cottonwood limestone. That's one of the ones that you can easily identify. This is a fusilin limestone. Um, and it looks kind of like this close up. Again, these things look like little fossil wheat grains. You get a sense of how big they are. Um, and this is a very common building stone in Manhattan. It's often used as it's an ornate stone. It's, it's, it has a really nice texture. It's often used as decorative stone or foundation stones in Manhattan. But what it's made up of is these little fossils. And those are actually single cells. Uh, it's, they're actually um, related to amoebas. Uh, they're like an amoeba with a shell. Uh, and they lived in the sediment. Uh, and they secreted these shells. Here they're cut longwise and here crosswise. They're very beautiful. Um, their shells are very, very beautiful. But the amazing thing is they're a single cell. So I think that's the kind of fascinating thing to point out is in those little cells, that, those little fossils you see, each one of those is a single cell uh, formed by a single cell animal. 